Um, welcome to Unsung Heroes, The Hidden Value of Seagrass Meadows. I'm Tanya Bryant uh, from Gert Arundel, and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. This webinar is part of the Blue Forest Week, which is hosted by the Norwegian Blue Forest Network or the NBFN. It's one of three events that we'll be hosting this week with a second webinar on seagrass restoration tomorrow and a hybrid event in Oslo on Thursday, looking at Norwegian Blue Forest Network or Norwegian Blue Forest and what's being done and what's more is needed. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the NBFN, we have a short video right now that gives a good overview of the network. So, and for those of you just joining us, if you want to turn off your video, it might make the feed a little bit easier for people who are struggling a little bit. So um, if you just want to turn off your video, great. And we'll just play a short inter uh, short overview of the, the video network um, right now. So thanks everyone. The Norwegian Blue Forest Network, or NBFN, is a partnership between the Norwegian Institute for Water Research, GRID Arendal, and the Institute of Marine Research. Established in 2014, the network's mission is to be the best source of reliable and up-to-date knowledge on Norwegian Blue Forests in order to raise awareness, offer solutions, inspire ecosystem-based policymaking, and encourage the sustainable use of blue forests in Norway and beyond. To achieve this, the NVFN's work is based on three pillars, gather, share, and convene. For the first pillar, NVFN aims to synthesize the latest research on blue forests by producing a range of outputs, including articles, reports, policy briefs, animation videos, and infographics. For the second pillar, the network works to share blue forest knowledge and expertise by holding presentations, attending events, writing editorials, building website content, and more. Our aim is to be a knowledge hub for Blue Forest resources. For the third pillar, NBFN brings together the spectrum of actors interested in the topic of Blue Forests, including policymakers, practitioners, researchers, civil society, teachers, and more. We do so by hosting and co-hosting a range of events. To learn more about the work of NBFN, Visit our website at www.nbfn.no and follow us on social media. But now for today's topic of seagrasses, their hidden values and really why why we should care. Um, in general this year, and certainly with the recent COP27 events and discussions, blue forest ecosystems like seagrass have really come into the spotlight. Globally, seagrasses are being seen as one of the most valuable ecosyst coastal ecosystems for both carbon sequestration, but also for other associated ecosystem services. And the science around this ecosystem continues to improve, bringing with it new ways to value seagrass and also a better understanding about the threats faced by these ecosystems and how to more effectively restore seagrass beds when needed. We have a great set of speakers lined up for you today. They will cover the trends of seagrasses, abundance in Europe, the seagrass abundance in Europe, why we need to do both protection and restoration, as well as globally how communities both use and benefit from healthy seagrass ecosystems. In the end, I think we'll have a really good idea about why we should care and value for seagrasses. After each speaker, we'll have time for one or two short clarifying questions as needed. Um, and after the last talk, um, Lena's, Lena's talk, we'll have time for more open Q&A sessions for about 10 minutes, followed by a panel to discuss some of these issues further. So during the talks, please feel free to add your questions to the Q&A box and we'll be monitoring them either to be answered by the speakers directly at the end of the talks or during the Q&A session later. And so without any more further ado, our first speaker will be Dr. Carmen Vidal Santos from the Marine Science Center in Portugal. Carmen is a research assistant at the Marine Science Center in Faro, Portugal. She is an experienced marine ecologist focusing on seagrass ecosystems investigating their provision of ecosystem services, including carbon sequestration, their functioning and their response to environmental impacts and their trend over time. Her research purpose and motivation is to advance ecological knowledge of seagrass to support science-based management, 
promote their conservation and inform national and international policy. In 2019, she led the first assessment of seagrass trends in Europe and she is currently involved in the first national assessment of blue carbon storage and sequestration in both seagrasses and salt marshes of Portugal. Welcome, Carmen. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. I hope you are well. First of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee uh, of the Blue Forest Week uh, 2022 for inviting me to participate in this seminar and to all of you uh, for joining us today. My name is Carmen Santos. I'm a serious researcher at the Center of Marine Sciences of Calgary in South Portugal, and I will talk uh, in this seminar about this uh, about serious trends in Europe and globally. I would like to start by highlighting why seagrasses are important. Well, first of all, uh, seagrasses are uh, marine flowering plants that form extensive underwater meadows and are distributed over the all continents except the Antarctica. Uh, there are about 70 species of, uh, of seagrasses and they cover an estimated area of about 300,000 square kilometers. Seagrass meadows are valuable coastal ecosystems for the many services they provide, some of them being um, globally important. I will list them very briefly. Um, well, seagrasses are support uh, global fisheries, they are also hotspots of marine biodiversity, including many protected and charismatic species. They filter the water, making it cleaner. They control diseases by reducing the exposure to pathogens. They regulate the climate through carbon sequestration and storage, and the buffer ocean acidification. They also protect our coast, and they provide opportunities uh, for recreational activities. In Europe, we can find four native seagrass species. Uh, Sostran is distributed almost, almost along the whole Europe. Simorosa and Odosa, of course, in the Mediterranean Sea, the southern Iberian Peninsula, and the Canary and Madeira archipelagos. Sostran marina is a pan European species, and Posidonia oceanica is endemic to the Mediterranean Sea. Being coastal ecosystem, uh, seagrasses are exposed to many human impacts, such as uh, coastal constructions, destructive fishing practices, and water quality um, degradation that leads to their loss. But also, seagrasses are able to uh, recover when the disturbance is removed in many cases. In Europe, both loss and recovery of uh, seagrasses are reported but the trends at the continental scale was not clear. To uncover this, a group of European uh, seagrass researchers set goals some years ago of assessing the seagrass trends, trends at the uh, continental scale. And in this study, we compiled assessment of change in more than 700 uh, seagrass sites along the coast of 25 countries from uh, 1869 to 2016. We included uh, different metrics of change, uh, such, a, such as area, but also uh, biomass, density, cover, the climates, and occurrence. Here we present uh, what we found in terms of uh, metrics of extent, which includes area, depth, limits, and occurrence. And we found that European seagrasses suffer a serious decline, with almost 70% of the monitor seagrass sites presenting a decline trajectory. We estimated that about one third of the area of European seagrasses was lost, mainly due to uh, disease uh, and also water quality degradation and coastal development. And we found that only 4% of the area was gained in this uh, time framework. Um, but these gains were uh, concentrated into grow uh, fast growing species, uh, Sostra Nolti and Simorosia nodosa. When we analyzed the trends over the last decades, we found that uh, the rate of decline in the area, which is the pink line in this graph, accelerated over the second half of the 20th century to peak at minus 30% per decade in the 70s. After that, uh, losses slowed down to lower rates during the 90s and the thousands, reaching similar rates in the, uh, than in the 50s. At the same time, the rate of increase in area, which is the green line in the graph, was uh, very able but low at the beginning, and in the last two decades, it increased uh, significantly. As a consequence, we observe a trend reversal in the net rate 
uh, of area, which is the black line in the graph, which is the sum of both the pink and the and the green lines, and uh, it's uh, this net rate was positive for the first time in in the 2000s, um, meaning that gains outweighs losses. Well, losses occur in the four species. I mean, the four species are responsible for for the uh, rate of loss in, in the pink line. It is true that uh, the high increase in the rate of uh, area gains was due to the recovery of software species in a few locations in Europe. The likely reasons uh, for the slowdown and the trend reversal of, uh, at the continental level uh, are probably the policy and management initiatives that were adopted in the 90s to reduce the water quality degradation in the European water as well as the designation of marine protected areas either at the national level or under the umbrella of the European Union Habitat Directive. We believe that the adoption of CIRAS's as indicators of ecosystem health under the European Union Water Framework Directive also contributed to decelerate the losses and enhance the gains. Probably these actions contributed in a different manner in the conservation uh, or in the trends of the four European species. Um, at one end of the range of the species, we, we have uh, the smaller, fast-growing uh, Sostra anoti, which is more sus susceptible to uh, disturbances, but also have a high recovery capacity. So the solely um, uh, restoration of the water quality may involve a rapid uh, recolonization by these species. On the other end of this spectrum, we have the large and slow-growing species, Procedonia oceanica, that is more resistant to the disturbance but has a low recovery capacity. In this case, uh, this species benefited more from the direct habitat protection. At the global level, uh, the first uh, seagrass assessment, assessment was published in 2009 by uh, Michelle Waycott and colleagues, and they found that seagrasses have been disappearing at a rate of more than 100 square kilometers per year since the 80s, and that around 30% of the known seagrass area had disappeared since the end of the 19th century. They also found that the rate of decline was accelerating from 0.9% per year before the 40s and uh, to 7% per year at the end of the 20th century. This alarming uh, rate placed seagrass meadows among the most threatening ecosystems on Earth um, in a comparable way than the uh, mangrove forests or coral reefs. Last year, Julian Dunick and colleagues published a reassessment of the global seagrass trends and found an overall trajectory of decline in the seven bioregions, which are here depicted in different colors in the map and in the graph. They estimated a global loss of 20% of the seagrass area that has been uh, monitored since um, the end of the 19th century. And uh, this loss was mainly due to uh, coastal development and water quality degradation. But they also found that in two uh, bioregions, uh, the uh, seagrass trend have uh, recently stabilized or even reversed. And this is in accordance with the uh, study that uh, we did in Europe. However, at the global level and in most of the bioregions, losses still outweigh uh, gains. To finish, I would like to highlight a few messages. So first is that uh, the recent study demonstrate that seagrasses losses still outweigh gains. Second, that Europe suffered a serious decline in the past, yet uh, this is not the generalized state nowadays. And we can also learn from Europe, from the European case, that uh, the acceleration and reversal of the declining trends are, are possible. So in the case of Europe, it is true that we lost one third of the seagrasses and this creates opportunities for, for recovery when possible, um, either through uh, restoring the habitat requirements for the seagrasses so they can recolonize naturally or through restoration projects by seeding and transplanting. And while this is, it is true that we've lost one third of the seagrass area, we still have two thirds of it. And uh, 
This gives us opportunity for seagrass preservation through a sustainable use of the seagrass habitats, uh, better management practices to mitigate uh, the present and the future threats, and by increasing uh, the resilience to climate change. I hope this message inspires the attendance to act in order to achieve uh, a net gain of seagrass area uh, in the coming decades, which I think is, uh, should be our common goal. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Carmen. I hope everyone um, was able to enjoy that that presentation. Carmen, maybe you can just come online um, and, and turn your video and things on. Hi, it's good to see you. Um, everyone, just a quick reminder, if you have questions for Carmen, um, put them in the Q&A box and we can ask her either now or kind of at the end when we have a, a longer Q&A session. Um, Carmen, I found the, the trends analysis really fascinating to see, like from a historical perspective, to see how it's gone up and down. I thought it's something I hadn't seen before. I thought it was really interesting. Um, one question that I do have, within Europe, do you see specific geographies that are, are doing better than others? It, I remember the map that you put up from, it looked like Portugal and Spain seemed to have a lot of like pink, indicating maybe declining, but it looked like maybe there were some like green spots around the UK and Ireland. I wonder if you can just maybe speak a little bit about that. Yes, sure. Um, there are some uh, I, um, some locations where, for example, Posidonia is very well protected, like in Corsica, and uh, you can see in the map that it's all uh, in yellow, which means uh, no no change in the status of the seagrasses, and uh, that would be one case where where um, this a different situation than in, as in the rest of Europe. Um, also, in the map, uh, we can see uh, very clearly because there are a lot of overlapping with the, with the points, but there are some places like Golden Sea where uh, Sostera and uh, recover well, and uh, that could be also one of the sites to highlight was, uh, with a positive uh, 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 recovery. Excellent, thanks. Um, I think we'll probably get into more of this maybe in the, in the panel discussion, so I don't want to take time from the other speakers. So, so thanks again, Carmen. Um, we are going to move on to our next set of speakers, which is um, Dr. Stacey Trevathan Tuckett and Dr. Paul Carnell from um, Deakin University in Australia. Um, Stacey's been an ARC DECRA research fellow at Deakin University's Blue Carbon Lab for over seven years. Stacey's a marine scientist whose research interests span from seagrass disease, microbes, um, blue carbon. Um, her research applies to biogeochemical um, microbiology techniques um, and uh, to improve the, the fundamental understanding of carbon cycling and microbial ecology and, um, and coastal restoration in the context of global climate change and ecosystem health and restoration. Paul uh, has been a research fellow at Deakin University's Blue Carbon Lab for also seven years. Paul is a marine scientist whose research aims to best inform restoration of um, environment by valuing the ecosystem services provided to humanity. Paul works across all coastal ecosystems from kelp forests to seagrasses, salt marshes and mangroves. With an ecological underpinning, he has worked on cost benefit analysis of coastal management actions by quantifying the blue carbon capacity of coastal ecosystems but also how they contribute to fisheries, protect our shorelines, and contribute to um, uh, recreation and tourism. Unfortunately, Paul and Stacey are not available to join us live uh, due to the time change with Australia. It's the middle of the night for them. Um, but if there are questions, we can ensure that they're passed on to them. And you can either post them in the, the Q&A box or send them specifically to nbfn at grida.no. Um, and we'll pop that in the in the Q&A box just so you guys have that email address. Um, but if you do have blue carbon questions specifically, um, Carmen can also try and answer them later in the Q&A session. She's got some expertise there. So um, so without further ado, we'll start playing Stacey and Paul's talk. And please feel free to add in questions um, during the talk as we go. Thanks, everyone. Hi, I'm Dr. Stacey Trevathan Tackett here with Dr. Paul Carnell. We're from Deakin University's Blue Carbon Lab in Australia and here to talk about seagrass blue carbon. Paul and I are presenting on the lands of the Wurundjeri and Wurundjeri peoples. We wish to acknowledge them as the traditional owners and would like to pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging. We would like to pay our respects to all Aboriginal and Indigenous peoples worldwide who may be here today. So what is blue carbon? Blue carbon is carbon captured and stored by the ocean 
um, coins because the oceans are blue. In contrast, green carbon is carbon stored by terrestrial forests. For blue carbon, the sequestration of atmospheric carbon dioxide is actually being done by three key ecosystem types, seagrass meadows, mangrove forests, and tidal marshes. And together, they cover about 1% of the um, ocean floor, but are responsible for capturing more than half of the ocean's carbon. There's a lot of interest at the moment on capitalizing on not natural biosequestration of CO2 and just trying to discover where these carbon hotspots are and how to maximize them. Blue carbon is one of the most promising at the moment for two key reasons. They are really fast at capturing that carbon, um, up to 40 times fast, faster than uh, some forests, and they can store that carbon for a very long time. So we're talking about hundreds or even thousands of years, so pretty much permanent carbon storage. So while green carbon is mostly stored in the leaves, branches, and trunks, blue carbon is mostly stored below ground, so the soils, the roots, and the rhizomes. For seagrasses, they cover about 0.2% of the world's oceans, and they sequester about 10% of the ocean carbon annually. And globally, that means about 20 billion uh, metric tons of carbon. And because of this, seagrasses are helping countries form and work towards nationally determined contributions, or NDCs, as well as Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs. Now, looking at this graph, you may think that seagrasses are looking a bit um, slower in the bar carbon burial rate. But actually, in some regions, seagrass meadows are so fast, they are kind of outshining some of the other ecosystems. Here's an example from Australia. So the soil carbon stocks for seagrass is about a third of those of mangroves in Australia per area. But when you count for all of the ecosystem, seagrass ecosystem in Australia, it's about uh, four times the amount of those compared to uh, mangrove and salt marshes. And the same is for sequestration rates. So the sequestration rate per area for seagrass is about a third of that of mangroves, but altogether it's about double the amount of carbon sequestered per year compared to mangroves, even seven times the amount compared to tidal marshes. So incredibly powerful uh, carbon sequestering ecosystems. So why do seagrasses have such great carbon superpowers? So they are very productive, so they produce their own carbon, particularly in the roots and the rhizomes, but they also trap incoming carbon. Their leaves slow down the water flow, allowing for carbon in the water column to get trapped. They're inundated by seawater much of the time, so waterlogged soils are anoxic, and they have a slower breakdown of the incoming carbon. And since seawater has a bunch of sulfate and sulfate reduction, this suppresses methanogenesis and uh, methane production. So overall, it's very low microbial activity. And so what the microbes don't consume, what carbon they can't consume, has the potential to be sequestered and preserved. And together, this means they can be very car powerful carbon sinks. However, um, seagrasses are being degraded worldwide, even lost. And we've lost about a third of our seagrasses um, uh, globally. So what does this mean for blue carbon? Well, say if you have poor water quality, seagrasses are going to be less productive and produce less carbon in their habitat. If seagrasses are lost, this also means that they're losing that ability to trap incoming. So both sources of carbon inputs are affected. The ancient soil carbon is also at risk. If the soils get disturbed, um, that will reintroduce them to fresh oxygen, fresh nutrients, and the microbes are going to go wild and have um, enhanced activity and the potential for more CO2 release. And this together might cause our carbon sink to turn into a carbon source and be releasing CO2. Now, this isn't a lost cause. There's a really great um, seagrass conservation and uh, restoration works going around the world, um, which will be the focus for tomorrow's talks, I think. Um, but for now, I will present or move hand this presentation over to Dr. Paul Cornell, who will now talk more about the rest, what restoration means for seagrass, blue carbon, and beyond. Thanks so much, Stacey. So my half of the talk, I'm really going to focus on the fact that now we know seagrass ecosystems are really great at storing carbon uh, in their plant material and in the sediments. What can we do to better manage that? Uh, those ecosystems and the carbon that's stored there. 
So the first thing that we can do is to protect uh, our seagrass ecosystems. We've just heard Stacey talk about uh, all of the things that make seagrass really great at storing carbon, but how that when we disturb them, we can actually start to release that carbon back into the environment and back into the atmosphere. So the first thing we need to do is to protect the seagrass meadows that we already have and those hundreds or thousands of years worth of carbon that is stored in the sediments below. So now there's three key ways that we need to protect our seagrass meadows. And that's through uh, protection from physical disturbances. So things like dredging, uh, protecting the ecology of the system. So that's the predators and the herbivores in the system, uh, but also protecting them from uh, nutrients and chemicals going into the environment. Because we know through these three pathways, uh, we both can lose the seagrass, but also the hundreds of thousands of years of carbon that they've been storing below in their sediments. So first off, we need to protect them. So what can we do next? Well, now that we've protected our seagrass meadows, we can actually now focus on the areas where we may have lost seagrass in the past. And we've just heard Carmen talk about uh, examples from Europe, but also globally of seagrass loss. Uh, but these are the places we can actually now focus on to restore seagrass meadows to restore seagrass meadows. Now I'm not gonna to focus too much on the different methods for restoring seagrass. Um, there's a range and there's um, uh, some other presentations this week on seagrass restoration, uh, but seagrass restoration can be quite costly, um, whether that's getting people out there to plant um, or some of the other methods. And so one of the reasons people have gotten really excited about blue carbon is because this might be a way that we can actually help fund the restoration of these ecosystems. So the first question is, can we actually store additional carbon by restoring seagrass meadows? So there's been a range of different programs uh, looking at establishing methods uh, for looking at coastal restoration and how we account for the carbon credits. And the short answer is yes, we can uh, help pay for seagrass restoration or restoration of mangroves and salt marshes uh, through these carbon credit systems. Uh, but we may also need to add on other ecosystem services or other financial uh, uh, mechanisms to help pay because um, so far it doesn't seem like carbon credits can pay for all of the restoration costs. Now I'm just going to quickly talk about some of the ecosystem services that we're focused on that might have some links to potential financial mechanisms to help pay for restoration of seagrass meadows. Uh, now first off is uh, uh, the carbon markets that I've talked about briefly and there's both international and national markets in that space. But we also know that seagrass meadows contribute uh, quite substantially uh, to recreational and also commercial fisheries. And so there might be ways that we can get those fisheries involved in uh, habitat restoration programs because of the direct benefits to the fisheries themselves. Uh, we can also look at their pollution filter uh, capacity, particularly around things like nitrogen. And in areas where we do have problems with nitrogen, we might be able to establish nitrogen markets and that restoring these seagrass ecosystems um, is actually storing additional nitrogen in the ground and we might be able to get funding through those pathways. And then finally, um, we know that seagrass meadows uh, protect against erosion and uh, can in some instances protect infrastructure. So uh, that could be another pathway where we might be able to tap into for, for funding of restoration. A bit of a case study of uh, how we've done this um, from some work that we've done here in southern Australia. We worked on these two bays. Uh, near the main uh, city of Melbourne, um, where there's about 17,000 hectares of seagrass spread across these two large embayments. So we found uh, across these different ecosystem services, uh, the seagrass was storing about 1.2 million Australian dollars uh, per year across these two bays. Um, from over 3 million recreational fishing trips that were happening each year through market and non-market values uh, added up to around $62 million each year. So that was a, a really quite a large value um, in terms of the nitrogen being stored in these systems um, and the local issues with, with nutrient pollution that added up to about $23 million a year. And in terms of uh, protection from erosion uh, in, in these particular bays added up to just over a million dollars. 
So when we stack all of those ecosystem services together, we find that a hectare of seagrass across these two bays, uh, and just for those four ecosystem services, is valued at about $5,000 uh, each year. And so in terms of a restoration business case, it'll then take a bit over 20 years for the, those values and those benefits uh, to add up to the costs. But beyond that, we're actually getting a net benefit. Um, and I think that's really the main story that we're trying to pitch here, that they're great for storing carbon and there can be some, some financial mechanism through there, but they do so much for us, um, including biodiversity and recreation and cultural activities. And so when we're restoring and protecting seagrass meadows for blue carbon, we're actually protecting them and restoring them for all of their other values as well. Thank you. Thanks so much to to Paul and Stacy. Um, unfortunately, as I mentioned before, they can't be here. Uh, they're in Australia, so um, their time change doesn't work for us. But if you do have questions, we've put um, in the chat the the email that you can uh, contact them at through us. So um, feel free to to send any questions you have. So um, so thank you again to them. Um, our next speaker today will will be Dr. Abu Hanna Mustafa Kamal from the University of Malaysia in Teragu. Um, Abu Hanna works as an associate professor at the Faculty of Fisheries and Food Science within the University of Malaysia Terengu, um, doing research on aquaculture and ecology. His current research project focuses on linking mangroves and seagrass ecosystems with community well-being, life and livelihoods. He has over two decades of experience working on seagrass and its ecosystems in Asia regions, specifically in Malaysia and Bangladesh. Welcome Abu Hanna. Uh, we'll get his presentation up and going. Um, if there's a, just as a reminder, if everybody um, who isn't speaking can just turn off their videos, um, that can that can help with connection issues for some people and can kind of clear the way for the, the presentation. Um, and the, the presentation will be up in just a minute. Thanks. Good evening. Good morning. Selamat pagi. Selamat petang. It is me, Abu Hena from University of Malaysia, Trenanu, Malaysia. First of all, I would like to uh, thank you to Blue Forest Week uh, for the giving me this opportunity. Today I am going to talk about the seagrass and its roles on coastal diversity and ecosystem. As you know that the seagrasses are Aquatic and juice form usually cram in the marine surrounding. They are the marine flowering plant. Usually grow in clear, shallow shores and coastal waters with 72 species worldwide. They provide themselves as a shelter and also, and then the, uh, they produce uh, uh, primary. Uh, as a primary production and then helping to the food chain and higher body breeds usually consume the seagrass leaf tissues like turtle, birds and marine mammals. Some of the invertebrates breeds grass on seagrass leaf, especially sea urchin. And also crustaceans are abundant in seagrass bat and one of the main source of food for fish in this bat. So as a habitat, what we can see now here, uh, they have the monospecific seagrass meadows, and they have the patches, and they have the multi-species meadows, usually grow in uh, coral reef, and then uh, intertidal uh, mangroves, and semi-enclosed lagoon ecosystem. What are the importance of the seagrass? Uh, they have the higher productivity, and uh, usually the organic matter production is higher, but compared to the terrestrial communities, uh, these are lower, but if among some communities is the highest one derived from the seagrass bed with maximum amount of 800 uh, gram carbon per square meter. And seagrass bed also helping in carbon sequestration in the marine environment. And you can, as you can see from this graph, and uh, this amount is really comparable compared to the other ecosystems in this in the world. And they also provide uh, food and shelter for many organisms, 
and huge number of mating species are listed as a consumer of uh, living uh, seagrasses. And most of the vertebrates uh, consumer or fish. And then in the seagrass bed, the materials used as a food were and seagrass themselves is being utilized by the isotopes and amphipores. Diatom crops and seagrass leaves utilized by the gastropod. And diatom and detritus and leaf surface is being utilized by the amphipod. And also algae, the benthic and epiphytes are found in the seagrass bed. And uh, my completely dominant food chain of the seagrass ecosystem usually. And therefore the major roles of seagrasses is, is a passive substratum of tropical import in epiphytic algae. And usually we can see here and the large number of herbivores include a dugong and then a dugong dugong. They fish exclusively on seagrass bat and then green turtles also eat seagrass and algae in the seagrass bat. You can see the four tools here and the two species are grazing happily on the seagrass bat. And uh, this is the dugon feeding trails in the Malaysian seagrass bed here is near the Singapore. And you can see here different types of, uh, you know, uh, feeding trails uh, in the seagrass bed. So also what you can see here, the seagrass uh, acts as an nursery ground for commercial uh, fisheries. And from planktonic larvae, many fish and crustacean choose to settle in the seagrass bed and because of the shelter provided. Plankton and epiphonal crustaceans on seagrass leaves used as a food by many fishes. And but seagrass provide the bulk of shelter availability in many stories. So without seagrass, what we can see here, shelter will be lacking or greatly reduced. Settlement, success of juvenile fish will be reduced. So at this graph we can see here and what types of fish are dominant in the seagrass bed and it has different colors here so you can see here three components and one is a fish species another one is a gastropods and another one is echinoderms so in in the pacific seagrass bed what we can see here the mainly we can see sea urchin sea cucumbers rabbit fish emperor crabs and prawns and different types of shellfish are utilized by the local communities and fishermen the another function of the seagrass bed is the nutrient cycling and uh, what you can see here sediment that receive light through the water column the trap nutrients decrease excess nutrients concentration that leads to phytoplankton to bloom and deplete oxygen level and as well as improve the water quality allow to submerge aquatic vegetation to grow which can aid the trapping suspended materials and reduce sediment suspension as well and also the seagrass the stabilizing the effect of uh, shorelines and sediment and these complex root systems of the seagrass meadow hold down the sediments and preventing coastal irrigations uh, uh, elsewhere in the world so seagrass economic uh, valuation of seagrass ecosystem uh, economic value of the seagrass uh, ecosystem and how economically value a seagrass bed uh, you can see here economic value of the goods and service provide both uh, include both use uh, as a fisheries and non-use values value of endangered species and aesthetic values for example what you can see here in train australia and then about 700k australian dollar and is contributed by the uh, seagrass and then florida and usa you can see here 48.7 million per year that's contributing by the seagrass ecosystem and also from the nutrient cycle function the the value is 3.8 trillion trillion the highest value among all other ecosystems value so what you see here the comparison uh, you can see here when looking the specifically of the value of the wetland service we can see here a uh, seagrass stand as a second you know and then the total value per hectare per year in us dollar is 19k under the wetland service this come from usually seagrass bed together with the algae 
And finally, in conclusion, I would like to say here, uh, globally, seagrass ecosystem is a great concern due to the human activities through it. It contains potentially importance on food service and maintain food waves for different types of marine organisms and animals. And finally, social, cultural and economic uh, retraction study with seagrass ecosystem and inhabitants are highly recommended for further study internationally or transboundary ecosystems like we have here in Coral Triangle initiatives containing different types of countries hosting the seagrass bear in Asian regions and other world as well. So that's all uh, from me. Uh, thank you so much for uh, giving me this opportunity. Thanks again. I will be happy to answer if you have any question. So that's all from me. Uh, thank you. And uh, if you have any questions, you are most welcome. And the reference will be provided upon request. Those are not cited in the slides. Thank you so much. Thanks, Abu Hana, um, for a really great presentation. I found it really interesting to see the graph showing all the different species and the different groups using the, the seagrass spreads. I think it really brings home just how diverse um, and how much diversity these, these meadows really do support. Um, we had one question asking about um, uh, a presentation, where will these presentations be available? And so we'll have these presentations up on the, the website probably later today. So um, Abu, I just have uh, one question. I wonder if you can just turn your video and your mic on and, and maybe we can, I can just ask one question. Yes, yes. S super, yeah. thank you. Hi, it's nice to see you. Yeah, um, yeah, I wonder, just just really quickly, I'm wondering, do the, the seagrasses in your region grow both intertidally as well as in the deep water? I'm just wondering if both the women harvesting in the shallow waters benefit from the seagrass ecosystems as much as the men who fish offshore and, and benefit maybe from the nursery habitats? Well, yeah, thank you so much for a nice question. And actually it works, uh, it grows in the tidal area and also as well as in the, the, in the shallow marine environment. And some of the intertidal area, the, especially some of the local communities and fishermen, uh, and they harvest uh, certain types of uh, fishery products like uh, mollusks and bibles, you know, and uh, they're used for their lives and uh, livelihoods. And as you know, that in the in the marine environment, and there are so many, uh, what they call this one, the fish catchment area is uh, nearby the seagrass ecosystems in this region as well. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, just to to keep to the time, I'm going to hold. I see there's one more question in the Q and A, but I'll hold that for the after we finish with with Lena's presentation, if that's okay. So thanks very much, Abu, Anna. Um, great. So we will we will continue with our final speaker today, which is uh, Dr. Lena Matwana Norland from the Uppsala University in Sweden. Lena is a senior lecturer in Uppsala University. Her research interest is in connecting nature and human well-being. She works with sustainable development of the coastal zone and uses an intertidal and transdisciplinary approach to gain more of a holistic understanding. She specializes in seagrass ecosystems and associated social ecological systems, specifically fisheries and ecosystem services. Lena is also the director of the Indo-Pacific Seagrass Network. So welcome, Lena. We'll get your presentation up right now. Thanks. Hi everyone, my name is Lina Antona Nordlund and today I'm going to talk about seagrass associated fisheries. I'm an associate professor in environmental science at the Department of Earth Sciences at Uppsala University in Sweden. And my researcher's interest is really about connecting ecosystems and human well-being. And I often work with the uh, seagrass meadows or seagrass ecosystem as a model system. I'm the founding director of the Indo-Pacific Seagrass Network, and that's a collaborative uh, research effort to improve our understanding of seagrass associated fisheries across the Indo-Pacific. Uh, I'm also the co-lead on seagrass at the Global uh, Ocean Observation Systems on the Biology and Ecosystems uh, Panel. 
And the mission of this panel is uh, to synthesize requirements and provide guidance to all countries on how to observe uh, living resources in the ocean. Uh, we have heard uh, that seagrass is globally extensive and um, we can find them, uh, find seagrass uh, along most uh, countries, uh, coastal countries, uh, coasts. And uh, seagrass uh, ecosystems uh, also are high in biodiversity, and many of these species are of interest uh, in fisheries. Uh, we also know uh, that seagrasses are great nursery grounds for fish. And they also, that the seagrass uh, ecosystem also provide trophic subsidies to adjacent habitats, which means that they are basically uh, yeah. moving energy between systems. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we know very little about seagrass as a fishing ground, especially on a global scale. And uh, Often, when we think about fisheries, we think about big industrial uh, fishing vessels or maybe boats uh, with fishing nets. Uh, but in seagrass, uh, this type of fishery is also very common. Uh, and uh, especially in the beginning of my career, I uh, focused very much on this kind of uh, fishery. And uh, this also sparked an interest for me to sort of learn more about seagrass fishery around the globe. So me uh, and uh, a team of very uh, amazing researchers uh, set out on a mission to sort of determine the importance and variability of seagrass uh, fishery activity globally. And uh, we used uh, uh, expert elicitation, because there isn't that much data uh, out there, uh, to try to learn more uh, about seagrass associated fisheries. Uh, so, uh, we investigated the purpose of fishing in seagrass, methods used to target species, and also how fishers access uh, seagrass fishing grounds. And really the key message of this is that seagrass fishery occur around the globe. Doesn't matter where you go, if there is seagrass, there is most, uh, very most likely some kind of fishing activity going on. Um, looking closer into the purpose of fishing in seagrass habitat, uh, around the globe, uh, the purpose of fishing in seagrass meadows are very diverse. Uh, we fish for food, for income, for bait, for curity, curio, but also different types of cultural and social uh, uh, reasons. Looking into the methods used when fishing in seagrass, so since seagrass is located in the intertidal down to around 60 meters uh, of water, any gear that can be used in very shallow uh, or exposed uh, seagrass meadows down to deeper waters can be used in the seagrass. The gears uh, used uh, range from bare hands, bow and arrow, clay pots, different uh, kinds of nets, trawls, cages, but also destructive methods uh, such as cyanide and explosives. And the target species, so seagrass meadows are multi-species fishing grounds. Um, and uh, uh, there's a lot of different types of, of species. Uh, and we can see that in developed countries, the seagrass fishery is often uh, recreational, like more of a sport, uh, sports fishing type, uh, and um, or more targeted species uh, specific. Uh, looking into how fishers access the seagrass fishing grounds, because the seagrasses can be near shore, it's possible to both walk and, and swim to your fishing ground, uh, but also different types of canoes, boats, uh, <laughs> both motor and sailing, and larger fishing vessels are used. Uh, in developing countries, there are often more different ways to access the fishing grounds. Uh, and we should also remember that uh, uh, in many of the developing countries, um, we have a warmer climate and um, a higher biodiversity. So more different types of target species. Uh, Analyzing this data, we can see that seagrass fisheries around the world are fairly similar. 
We can see indication that when target species are diverse, then people adapt to this and use different gears and transport means to exploit those resources. And the richness of purposes uh, of uh, fishing activity does not appear to change with respect to the human uh, development index. And uh, the message really to policymakers and management managers is that seagrass, uh, seagrasses are common fishing grounds, large diversity of fish and invertebrate species, and also uh, algae are targeted in seagrass meadows, and seagrass meadows are important for subsistence, recreational and industrial fisheries. And this needs recognition in management and uh, definitely also in fisheries management. And of course, this sparked a lot of more interest. Uh, so we started to look more into the extent, the importance and nature of fisheries exploitation uh, of seagrass meadows. And uh, we created a, a database, uh, an effort led by Richard Answorth to sort of uh, look into which fish species are documented to utilize seagrass meadows at some kind, at some point of their life stage or some point, at some point during their life. And we have uh, recorded uh, over 2,000 uh, different fish species being recorded uh, using seagrass at some point of their life. And just here in the North Atlantic, there's uh, over 297 uh, different species. And looking at those species, which species are seagrass associated, uh, matching that uh, with uh, uh, the FAO most uh, landed species list, uh, we see that 21.5% of the fish in metric tons are seagrass associated species. So it's really a need to expand the research into uh, the nursery habitat links to mature exploited fish stocks. Um, there's also large data gaps uh, with respect to invertebrate fisheries. An ongoing, uh, quite interesting project, in my opinion, uh, is this Indo-Pacific Seagrass Network. There is where we're really trying to do collaborative research on seagrass, their associated fisheries, and human well-being uh, across the Indo-Pacific to get a better and uh, better understanding of how important seagrasses are as a fishing ground. So uh, the key message of this talk, or the key messages of this talk today, is that fished species, they live somewhere in the sea at any given time. Some of them, they live in the same spot their whole life, but some of them move around a lot. And we all know this, but it has quite a lot of implications. So that means that we need to make the connection between all the habitats that the fished species live in and consider all those habitats in different types of management. Fishing quotas, gear restrictions, etc., uh, in fishery or for fisheries management is not enough. If the fished species don't have a suitable place to live during their whole life, we cannot expect healthy stocks in fisheries. So we really need to think about the ocean as it's the system that it is. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Lena. Um, thank you so much for for a really great talk. I think um, I think your last point about needing to think of the ocean as a system is a really great way to to finish up these presentations. And I think it sums up a lot of what the speakers have been trying to say. Um, we do have a few questions coming in. Maybe I can just ask one, Lena. In as I asked to to Abu, um, what do you see the difference in the way men and women use seagrass beds in, in your research? And do you think that has an effect on, on the policy in terms of how things get managed? Um, if, if I think about fisheries uh, and looking at the difference of men and women, it's uh, I would say it's especially that women target more and more diverse, uh, more, more different species. Uh, while men often use a bit more advanced gear and uh, go further out and sort of target more one one type of species or maybe a, a couple. That's that's super interesting. I might ask you a little bit more about that during the the panel discussion just to to bring that out. Um, 
uh, if the other speakers want to want to turn their cameras on now, we've got a couple of, of questions coming in. Um, Carmen, I have one that I think that maybe you can best answer. Um, and and the question is, um, is the, the production or the carbon capture equally high for the Norwegian eelgrass uh, where we have cold water most of the year? Sorry, can you repeat the question? Sure, yep. Is So the question was about the Norwegian eelgrass and the Norwegian seagrass. Um, and, and the question was, is the production or the carbon capture equally high as for tropical species as for um, here in the areas where we have cold water for much of the year? Um, well, I'm not uh, very uh, confident with data from the north, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> Um, but I guess that uh, there is one point that is important to consider when comparing seagrass uh, potential for carbon uh, sequestration and storage in different sites, which is uh, um, if uh, the needles are annual or, or, or they are, uh, if they are perennial, if they are all the time, or if they are just only in the spring and summertime, which I guess is, is the case of. Uh, of uh, Norwegian uh, eelgrass. So um, probably. The, they uh, store less carbon, I would say. I don't know if someone uh, in the in the public uh, can help me with this, <laughs> yeah. but I guess that is uh, a little bit le um, uh, less um, uh, less important in carbon storing because of they are not the whole year. Okay, thanks. Um, we do have somebody, so we have someone on the team here and she's going to be the moderator for the Seagrass Restoration webinar tomorrow. Um, Karine Gagnon, I don't know if you want to join. I know that you've done a little bit of research on this if you want to um, if you want to add something more specifically. So thanks for joining us kind of on the fly about this. Yeah. Hi, yes. So uh, as Tonya knows, um, there is a Norwegian Blue Forest Network initiative to um, actually get some data for Norwegian blue carbon, uh, seagrass blue carbon. Specifically, we know that um, actually, and and it seems uh, what you said, it should be logical that the cold water should have lower carbon storage, but um, from data from Denmark, it seems that the Kattegat Skagerhawk is actually a blue carbon hotspot because there's so much organic matter uh, in the sediments. So it looks like in these kind of muddy, really muddy sediments that there's actually a lot of carbon, but if you go up further north where the sediments are really sandy uh, exposed then there's quite low carbon so it, there's a lot of variation even within um, the same geographic area yeah thanks thanks for joining us Karine. um i think as we said the science on on especially this ecosystem is just evolving um you know each year we we seem to learn more about it and especially around the carbon storage so i think this is kind of like a quite an interesting and a, and a hot spot to to continue to watch um i had another question and maybe this is more for for lena and abu Hanna about um about the connectivity between seagrass meadows and mangroves in and looking at is there a connectivity between the biodiversity um do seagrass meadows support and produce more biodiversity in mangroves and vice versa is there a lot of connectivity between those habitats that are often found close together i don't know if either one of you are are welcome to take it or both i, I could answer <laughs> sure okay. uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's all about the seascape, what's happening around the seagrass. Uh, I mean, if, if we're focusing on the seagrass, it's all about what's happening around it. If it's mangroves, if it's corals, uh, if it has a lot of high um, biodiversity of ecosystems, uh, it really matters for the seagrass. Uh, for example, there was some uh, uh, research coming out a couple of years ago uh, from Australia where they sort of show that seagrass is a sink for different types of pathogens in the water that makes the adjacent or nearby coral reefs being much healthier, for example. So they are supporting each other in many different ways, not just uh, by, by um, uh, the mangroves and the seagrass or just by nurseries or fish moving around uh, um, so yeah it's a it's pretty it's a pretty cool system and you can really see that uh, they're really supporting each other nice thank you abu Hanna, did you want to add to that they will delina already pointed the things uh, these three ecosystems actually these are uh, highly interconnected 
uh, especially the seagrass and mangroves and, and coral reef. And if you can see here, uh, maybe you can say for the seagrass bed and more of the nursery, you know, the, all the small fish, uh, where the place that can get to hide from the predatory fish compared to the, you know, the mangroves and uh, this is uh, compared to seagrass is a little bit open in general. And then uh, in the coral reef and, uh, and some of the fish are moving around, you know, those are uh, living in the coral area and also migrating uh, to the seagrass bed for their breeding. And also when they become juveniles and then uh, move to the coral reefs. So it's not only the, uh, the fisheries, there are a lot of, uh, in terms of nutrient food, uh, in terms of nutrition nutrition, sedimentation, and then uh, suspension of the, you know, the uh, sediment particles, you know. So all these are uh, three, uh, types of uh, components they have the different uh, function and overall and uh, this uh, function is more or less a link uh, among uh, this ecosystem yeah. thank you thanks um we had a, a similar question that a lot i think a lot of people are quite interested in this connectivity between seagrass and and other habitats and how they they um, they support other ecosystem services and and so maybe the second half of, of this other question was um, how can we improve our knowledge and understand the habitats functioning within this landscape context and and better management because I think you know those of us who work in the oceans everything's kind of siloed right it's fisheries management it's habitat management and and so I think we're missing that that holistic nature so I don't know if um, and that's a question open for all of you if if anybody especially both from kind of the the tropical point of View as well as from the more European point of view. So um, if anybody would like to start, that'd be great. Well, I, I see that, uh, I can say that uh, for blue carbon, for example, seascape is, uh, is very important as well uh, because of all the transfer of organic matter from one habitat to another. So I think that one way of improvement, of improving our knowledge on uh, how important is this case for management is to start um, uh, researching uh, these ecosystems uh, together at the same time because sometimes the studies are focused on only on seagrasses but those seagrasses are surrounded by salt marshes for example so it's important to keep everything uh, together when we uh, um, design our experiments and our studies um, to create that knowledge what, that will be important for, for the managers. Yeah, thanks, Carmen. Thanks. I think that's that's really valuable to, to keep in mind for future studies. Lina or Abuhana? You will, <laughs> but uh, once you talk about the habitat management, actually, you know, the uh, just now the, 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 or the previous, the first speaker already mentioned about it. So, but the, when you think about the habitat management, especially, so as you know that we have the four types of habitats uh, here. Uh, one is you can say salt mars, another one is you can say grass, another one is mangroves, and then another one is coral reef. But you know, then uh, in one policy, we cannot, uh, one types of management, we cannot do, uh, we cannot manage these four types of habitat. And because uh, these four types of uh, habitat needs different types of uh, characteristics for their survival. For example, so you can say here the mangroves cannot grow in the sandy area. On the other hand, seagrass grow in the, the, the maybe the sandy or muddy area, and the coral reef that is more clear water compared to the mangroves. So it's a complex issue, you know, once you're talking about the management issue. But uh, so the case we have to deal one by one. If you you know the think about the if we think about the management for these types of ecosystem. Uh, for the better management uh, for the uh, of the marine fisheries and yeah, marine ecosystem as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lena. Yeah, I, as I said, I, I mean, the whole, the, our whole planet is one system, and everything is connected. Um, even if we think about the ocean or the coast as one system, we know that one of the biggest threats to to seagrass is this kind of diffuse land runoff. So that means we also have to consider what's happening on land. Otherwise, we can't really address uh, many of the challenges that the, the, the seagrass meadows are, <laughs> are suffering from. Um, so, I mean, think of it as a, a big, very complex uh, system. 
And just because one thing works in one place, it doesn't mean that it works in the next place. So we have to be very adaptive and uh, open our minds and try to work together to, to advance monitoring and research and conservation of, of seagrass. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think that's that's a great, we have one more question, although that's a really great segue into the panel discussion, but I think I'm gonna ask this one question. It's directed uh, for you, Lena, um, and it is, do you have any data on how quickly different types of fisheries can adapt to changes in seagrass ecosystems? Uh, for example, shifts in community structures, um, things like that. No, no. Not really, because now you're talking, I think the question was about how quickly the fisheries can actually affect the seagrass ecosystem. Uh, I don't know, but uh, we see, for example, in some places, if you really target the fisheries, you, okay, there is, for example, some someone coming, okay, for Curio, we want to buy this kind of shell and everyone goes out and sort of vacuums the, the area for that or for sea cucumbers, uh, for example. Uh, and I mean, that, of course, drives some kind of change in the ecosystem. Um, but again, we have other systems around. There might be nearby seagrass meadows that can sort of supply that uh, that fishing ground with new <laughs> with new species. Um, but there's very, very little done on that, how much uh, fishing pressure actually changes the seagrass ecosystem. But that's a, that's a good one to continue working on. <laughs> when you can add to your, your research question list. So, um, and chance. anyone who wants to join me, just contact me. <laughs> <laughs> excellent, excellent. Um, so so thanks for that. Um, I think that's all the questions that we have in, in the Q&A box, although if people still have questions and you want to add in, definitely. Um, but I did want to, um, just kind of keeping track of the time, I just wanted to move into into a bit of a more discussion, a bit of a panel. And so this is this is a very casual um, panel. So so I'm happy to kind of, you know, ask a few leading questions. And then if you guys want to, to discuss, I'd be very happy to kind of keep it as casual as, as possible. Um, the first question that I was I was thinking about, and we've touched on this a little bit already, is about threats. And so, Carmen, you you mentioned it specifically in your presentation. Lena, you mentioned it just now um, in terms of like um, you know diffuse pollution and things like that. And so, I'm wondering, um, you know, kind of if you guys want to talk a little bit about what you see the main threats are. Maybe maybe in the different regions they're quite differently, but also um, based on the threats, where do you see the areas for most improvement or to help ensure that things like restoration efforts are successful? Do you think it's around changes to like fisheries policies, for example, or do we just need more MPAs everywhere that seagrass is? Um, that's the type of, of thing I'm wondering about. So and, and maybe Carmen, you want to start? Well, the, the first, uh, the two most um, common um, threats to seagrasses are fossil development and uh, water quality degradation. And as Lina said before, this comes from land. So it's the first where we have to manage these uh, threats. And um, well, there is uh, that there is still a lot, uh, a lot of room for improvement uh, regarding management. But uh, it is true that uh, we have also done a lot in the last decades. I would like to put an example for Posidonia Oceanica in the Mediterranean Sea, uh, which is related to uh, uh, fisheries uh, policies as well. Uh, bottom trawling was one of the main causes of uh, Posidonia decline uh, in the 80s. And in the 90s, there was, uh, uh, it was uh, approved uh, directive, um, and also at the national levels in, in countries such as uh, Italy, France, and Spain. There was a lot, a lot of relation down to uh, forbidden, uh, to forbid um, uh, trolling, bottom trolling practices on on top of the seagrasses, and I think that uh, that uh, saved a lot of Posidonia hectares in, in the Mediterranean Sea, and uh, it was something that it was uh, I, I would say that it was one of the first conservation measures at regional or even at the European level that helped seagrasses to. Well, at least to stop a little bit the, the decline. Uh, and regarding MPAs, it is true that uh, we could include uh, more seagrasses into uh, protected areas. Uh, there are still many areas in, in Europe and, and, and globally as well 
uh, that are not included in protected areas. But it is also true that those that are already in, um, I mean, declare as uh, protected areas is not totally working. And sometimes it's because there is not uh, res enough resources, at least in Portugal, um, in natural parks, there are not enough resources, human resources of funding uh, to make sure that the regulations are, 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 are done properly. So, and sometimes, of course, there are illegal uh, uh, activities that uh, are eluding those, uh, those uh, legal texts. So I would say that there is a lot of uh, uh, room still for improvement, but it, it, we also should uh, look at what we have done that had worked to repeat that and continue doing that. Thanks. Um, Abu Hanna, do you want to do you want to add to that? Very well, but uh, in terms of the measured fresh here, what we can see in the uh, Asian country. The, as uh, Carmen already mentioned, is the coastal development is a huge, and then second one is the you know the sedimentation, uh, and the sedimentation, uh, and then another one is uh, is coming from the nutrient influence, uh, coming from the, uh, the, the up, uh, and the, from the land, and those are going on the seagrass bed and growing the algae coverage on the in the seagrass bed, and then once the algae cover on the seagrass bed, and eventually all the seagrass die in the area. And uh, these are the, the main threats here. And then uh, what you can see here in terms of the marine protected area, and then uh, the seagrass over here actually, uh, those are in being, uh, those are safe, especially in the marine protected area. And the rest of the area here in Asian country, especially in the Malaysia and some of the country work in Bangladesh. And uh, these are not safe actually in terms of the, the human human uh, the interactions, you know, and then. And destruction and then destructive you know, fishing there they use this uh, in the cigars bed for the uh, fisheries uh, uh, industry and the catching the fisheries and uh, disturbance of the cigars bed as well so that's the one i can I can hear uh, especially and then and another one in terms of the restoration and conservation work and over here in asia i think it's not that much and maybe in, in south korea and then japan and Indonesia, they have some few, and the rest of the country, uh, it's not really. And the Philippines, Philippine, that is some, but the, the wrongly, it's, and the size selection was totally wrong. I saw in the, some of the papers and some of the presentations. And the place, and um, it's not the seagrass bed before, but they want to plant the seagrass bed. So this is not also the wise in terms of the estimation process for managing the seagrass bed in this area. So that's all for me. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Lena, maybe you can build on that a little bit. Yeah, I, I just a very few few key things. Um, it's always cheaper to try to protect what we have. Uh, and also, there we know that the system is working. Uh, doing something is better than nothing. Uh, uh, but uh, as Carmen said, there is definitely room for improvement, but again, doing something is better than nothing. Yeah, yeah, I think, and I think that is, I think that can be applied globally that, I mean, and that's for all ecosystems. I mean, we're in the decade of, eco of ecosystem restoration right now, and, and I think the message does need to be that, you know, we need to be protecting what we have before we need to restore it because restoration is expensive and and for seagrasses, it doesn't always work. You know, the percentage of, of it is quite low. And so, yeah, I think the a good take home message is, you know, let's protect what we have before we have to restore it. So, um, but maybe that leads into the, sorry, Lena, did you want to add anything? Go ahead. No, but I mean, of course, we also need to restore, but, uh, often when we restore, then we think about, OK, what are the threats? We try to remove them and doing all those things that we should do for the things that we already have, um, which is a very. Yeah, it, it, it's uh, it's important to think about it. <laughs> thank you. It is a good point. It's a good point. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, maybe restoration helps us value what we have in place already, so or helps us look at it differently, so. Yeah, um, but but kind of building on that, maybe I can follow up with a, another question that you guys can discuss. Um, 
what questions, either research or management or policy, do you think need to be asked more or just aren't being asked now? Kind of what are the research gaps? Maybe what needs more funding? Um, what what areas need to be looked at a little bit further? So um, I don't know if anybody wants to start. Maybe Abu Hanna, I don't know if you want to start with that one. Well, uh, then uh, actually the, the most important for us here, uh, I can tell in Asia and uh, some of the far here actually, but I cannot tell about Europe and other country in Africa because I have an experience over there. So what you can see here, the, 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 the most important uh, things to be included in the policy or maybe the funding agencies here, and that one is awareness activities. And then a community awareness in terms of uh, ecosystem service and ecosystem and the linkage of the sea grass. And then because we are talking about the blue carbon, so we can cover it as well as mangroves and also the you know, coral reef and salmon ecosystems. So that is not really done actually here in uh, Asian, some of the South Asia and Southeast Asian country. Especially people uh, don't know about the ecosystem service. Those are provided by these types of important ecosystems. On those, uh, their life and livelihoods are dependent. So these things have to focus more in terms, together with uh, uh, you know the the field research uh, in terms of uh, you know monitoring, in terms of survey, in terms of the explorations, and then together because the habitat is already destroyed. Some of the area, you know, then, then I can say. The most of the area here, the most of the signal is that actually is declining trend in South Asia and Southeast Asia. So that things can be addressed uh, in future, and then especially on the awareness and um, community labors and ecosystem services on these uh, resources. Yeah, thank you. Carmen Alina, do you want to add anything to that? Um, so I, I would highlight two uh, set of questions. First is regarding climate change. I think we something that uh, we are already experiencing, and uh, we need to uh, understand how seagrasses are going to or are already um, responding to uh, the consequences of climate change, and how we can uh, increase their resilience to to it. And the second set of questions, uh, something that is very basic. But and sometimes overlooked, but is uh, the base of everything regarding seagrass conservation, restoration, and management. And this is seagrass mapping, seagrass mapping and monitoring. This is something that uh, has been done in many places, but uh, normally has not a continuity on time because of the lack of funding or because for researchers sometimes it's just boring to to measure the same thing over time. Yeah, it is true. We we like to have hypotheses and test our ideas and and this is something that should be shared between uh, researchers, managers, uh, citizens. Uh, I think it is something everyone should be involved because it's the basic and we need to, the, the maps and the, to, uh, we need to know what seagrasses are and how they are doing um, as a base for restoration, for example, for conservation, for management, but also for mapping the ecosystem services, which is so important for us now. So I would uh, highlight those two uh, questions: uh, how they will, how they are responding to climate change, and uh, and uh, the assessment of the of the currents and, and the status of seagrasses. Okay, thanks, Lena. Do you want to add anything to that? Or? Yeah, I, I really want to follow on what the, what you said. That I mean, it's very basic with mapping, but we need to do it. We need to observe. The sea, we need to observe the seagrass to understand change. And the more we can coordinate this effort and do it in a comparable way across the globe, the better data we will have, the better understanding we will have. Uh, so that is would, some, would be something that would be very fantastic. And that's uh, not just for seagrass, but for everything. Uh, and... Um, I'm saying it again. I mean, everything is a system, right? And we need, no one is uh, an expert in everything. Uh, so we need to work together. We need to combine uh, different types of, of skills and uh, understanding, uh, also cultures, uh, 
on how to sort of advance uh, seagrass conservation. And um, yeah, that is the, the really the thing. We need to work together. That's really great. Um, I want to follow up on that one. We have a question that's really related to that one or a comment, but I, I wanted to loop back just for a second on the mapping um, aspect of things, because I know that it is an area that we're missing, but it's my understanding, and I'm not a seagrass expert by any stretch, um, that mapping seagrass is really tricky. I mean, you can go out and you can, you know, you can just send divers and everything like that, but to do it on on this broader scale um, is is quite difficult. It's not like, like you can use or maybe you can use satellite data like you would for mangroves and things like that. I'm wondering if any of you can kind of speak a little bit about about where we are in the mapping techniques or the, the technology that we could use. We have one of the world leading people oh, <coughs> visiting this uh, this webinar if we want to invite him. <laughs> I'm not sure somebody's got their hand raised, so maybe somebody wants to. Yeah, um... and that's the guy. <laughs> OK, maybe he can. Demetrius, do you want to jump on here? Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very Thanks. much. Hello, friends. Hi. Carmen, Lina, Abu. Hi. Yes, Hi. Uh, we are working on seagrass mapping. We love to do this boring work. Being honest, I love to to jump into satellite imagery and diving and hydroacoustics. It is time consuming, uh, but it is cost effective if we can combine citizen science approaches uh, that send divers and fishermen collect data with the sonars and uh, ground truthing, and from our side to to put satellites, Copernicus Sentinel mission, it's amazing, 10 meters. We map the whole Mediterranean with Demos and other teams uh, down to 20 meters. Going commercial data for local scale studies, I do mapping with down to 40 meters in, in Greece, in Heraklion, in Crete. We can use planet data, everyday data at three meters. We can go to the back to the past uh, using Landsat legacy from 1975. We can have data at 30 meters. Uh, OK, 30 meter pixel size is not very fine, but using a fraction mapping approaches and mixing to calculate the. The percentage of the secret occurrence in each pixel and so the evolution either expanding or reduction through the time and space mm -hmm. and uh, giving such data availability. We just need, um, I think, a, a coordinated effort to put everything into something useful that can give critical data for mapping, setting baseline, monitoring, exploiting where cigars are under pressure and we lose them or are other three when we have beautiful meadows that support services, functions, interlinked uh, pathways between habitats because they are not autonomous. We have seagrasses close to reefs, close to sandbanks, and each of these habitats give and take something from each other, from fisheries, nurseries, and so on so far. I think that we, we are not missing the tools or the methods and the ways. We are missing something coordinated to go forward. Yes, Lina. Uh, I have to unmute. Uh, hopefully, within the work within the Global Ocean Observation Systems, uh, me and Emmett Duffy, that are the, the co-leads uh, for Seagrass, we will uh, we will really try to to coordinate this effort uh, around the globe. Um, so we are working on it, and uh, we are uh, going to arrange workshops, uh, <laughs> inviting the global community, and to see how are we going to coordinate uh, our work, how are we going to advance uh, research around. And monitoring and and uh, conservation around and around seagrass to be continued. That sounds great. Also, a, a research question that it is quite interesting and it is, I think, uh, interesting to the audience here is how we can measure the blue carbon from space, not in terms of extent, but if we can quantify at per pixel level the organic carbon sequestration uh, at least in the above ground biomass. Uh, and this is also very challenging and very interesting to see if it is feasible at wider scales beyond the locations that we collect cores and make the measurements in the lab. And this is something I think quite uh, looking forward to as a research question. 
Thank you. I'm I'm so glad you you popped in, Demetrius. It's um, yeah. I think that's really valuable information for the people on. Um, we also have another hand up from from a network member, Hege Gunderson, who is also well versed in in mapping. So Hege, I wonder if you want to just pop in and um, and and answer a few things. Uh, yes, I just uh, wanted to mention drones since we are uh, uh, gaining uh, a lot of knowledge within using drones in the in the in mapping of seagrass and other types of vegetation. So uh, that is uh, we have been working on that for a couple of years, and we see huge benefits of using drones in a high resolution uh, images and machine learning uh, and all that. Uh, yeah, long process of, uh, of different techniques. Uh, we do see uh, vegetation in the satellite images, but it's very, at least for now, very different. Difficult to see the difference between seagrass and other uh, types of vegetation like uh, macroalgae and and that. So drones is the thing, I think. Mm. Is a multi-scale approach. Drones at the fine, at very fine scale, commercial satellite data at other scales, and go beyond that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and to train the model using drones, maybe, and of course you have to be there in the field doing the ground truth things you you talk about. Uh, but then maybe upscale to the satellite images is is the goal. Yes, and uh, a key message I think is that uh, to anybody that want to go mapping is that if you don't put your face in the water, go for field work, you will never do something good. So for me, field work is the baseline, and a lot of people ignore field work or hate field work, or, but it is the baseline. You have to understand the place you want to work. Hmm. I think that's. Um, I think that's a really great segue to um, to this last con this this last um, question that we had. It was more of a comment, but I did want to read it out because I think it was really valuable. We've been talking a lot about the need for citizen science, the need for on the ground, the need for um, engaging many people. And so I'll just read the the, the comment because I think it was quite nicely written. Um, it says the question of connectivity is relevant for the habitats, but more urgent for the experts as well. For example, I can see here a great number of biologists or blue carbon enthusiasts. Where are the economists, local community users, land use decision makers? We can study and understand these systems as much as possible. However, if we don't have the right set of stakeholders sitting or talking together, nothing will happen. And I think everyone's kind of touched on this need for for like a wide engagement, community engagement, um, citizen science. I mean, there's so much that needs to be done. It can't just be held by, you know, the academic biologists or or whomever. Um, and so I think it is something valuable. Um, and it brings me to maybe the last the last question I had or the last discussion, a point I wanted to bring up about how do you make people care? You know, we've we've all talked about engaging with communities, but what kind of stories do you tell different stakeholders, such as fishermen or communities? To, to make them want to become more involved in seagrass or to help them understand the value of the seagrass so that, that they can become engaged in, in this type of work we're doing. And so, so Lena and Abu Hanna, I know that you guys work um, more closely with, with communities. Carmen, I'm not so sure with you, but, but maybe Lena, you want to start this one off and then, and then everyone else can jump in a little bit? No, I think it's all about making everyone feel included. Uh, and in general, I actually think the, the seagrass, uh, at least the research community is very inclusive. We are we are all team seagrass. Everyone is part of team seagrass. Um, but also a lot of people in working with seagrass are having a more social ecological uh, approach. And I think a lot of us are working with the communities. Um, because they are the users, they are the owners or the stakeholders of, of these uh, resources. And uh, for example, within my research, I do a lot of interviews, I sit down, I do workshops, community workshops, and uh, trying to understand the, the system. Um, because learning from the communities, it's really giving you clues. And uh, sometimes they see phenomena that I can then try to go back and try to understand more uh, scientifically. But be inclusive and, and share the results and uh, listen to 
listen to the people that are uh, that are sort of the the owner the owners of that system the the ones that are most closely connected to that system um, I mean, we will we will come nowhere if we are not working together. Society, research, uh, uh, policy, management. Yeah, thank you. I agree. Um, Abu or or Carmen? Well, uh, it's all about the awareness. Actually, the awareness is very important uh, with the community level. And then uh, the function, the ecosystem functions, and then uh, or maybe the tangible and intangible benefits, direct or indirect benefits coming from these types of ecosystems. And then because uh, you know the people over there when they see you know especially the fishermen community, and uh, they are very forgetful actually. Um, but uh, you know what they see the fish uh, is there. And they don't uh, bother about the other habitat, whether it's going to destroy or not. By hook or crook, they want fish. That means they want money. So the most important thing is that the, the law enforcement, and then uh, beside law enforcement, and then we have to educate them. And sometimes the law enforcement doesn't work with these uh, types of coastal communities. They say, if you stop them, what do you eat? The first question will come from them, you know, what do you eat? How will you survive? So the, to me, the first one is awareness and make them uh, understandable uh, by saying that to community or maybe the focal group discussions. Nina always used to do this one. I think she's a great expert. And to me, I go and let's just collect the samples. I don't work the com with the community that much. So uh, actually to make them understand and understandable and then uh, in terms of uh, ecosystem services and importance of these resources. And then hopefully that someday they will be able to understand and you know uh, and about this the function and the importance of seagrass mangroves and palmers and coronal ecosystems under the the blue economy. Uh, yeah, that's all. Thanks, thanks, Carmen. Yeah, I, I totally agree with uh, Nina and Abu. I think that's uh, being inclusive is essential and increasing awareness as well. Uh, here in Portugal, I would like to give a few examples of what have worked for us. And uh, we have uh, several projects uh, with uh, children and uh, um, and teachers as well. So from our part, we wish we give to the teachers the knowledge and uh, and the tools, even tools. I mean the physical tools. Uh, to go to the field and experience seagrass uh, firsthand. I think this is very important that people feel with their hands the mats, the plants, everything. Because going to a class and another power po um, PowerPoint presentation, I think is not very effective. Uh, it it may work for us, <laughs> for grown ups, but uh, <laughs> for adults. But uh, with children, uh, I think, uh, and this is a very important uh, part of the society. Uh, because it's the future and uh, we're trying to solve the problems that we created but we will have to face the problem that we created as well so i think this is a very important uh, part of the community we need to focus on yeah thank you um and i think that's maybe one that is not always thought of in and bringing in the, the students at, at all different levels i think is super important um i see that demetrius has one uh has his hand up would you like to join us again yes uh, thank you again for the jumping. What uh, we have to do, the scientists, uh, we have to write the newspapers, in, uh, in articles in newspapers, articles in the popularized journals, not only the, for the science, but for the society. And what we have to do is to use multimedia tools. Now we can have access to very low, to budget friendly tools like the GoPros, create photography, create videos, and post them around. Uh, also engage, as Carmen says, the, the 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 children from the schools into the sea, not in the in the in the lab in the class, and put them forward to to feel and sense the systems. For the policymakers, see, it is a little bit hard, but sometimes again, if you start talking with them, because also what we miss is to talk with the policymakers. We think that it is not our job. 
but they say also that uh, it is not their job to come to us and so on. We have to bridge that gap. It's hard, it's not easy, but uh, for me, is the only way to go forward for actual protection. How many, never, how many articles will we write in journals and uh, talking about the problems, they don't give a shit in the end if we don't put them in the reality. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's low level wording that we have to, to use to make them understand that seagrasses are not just plants that will die off the leaves and then we have dirty beaches. When in the first major here in, in Crete, I talked about the, the banquets on the beaches, that this leaves means that you have healthy seas inside. He was very surprised because they believe the opposite. They believe that this bad thing on the beach. Yes. Thanks. Um, Thanks. I think I think the the discussion around how to how to translate the science into messages for for the different stakeholders, whether it be school children, policymakers, mayors, whomever it is. I think that's something that that you know we certainly talk about, and it's certainly um, it's certainly where science needs to go. Right? It's I mean we need to do the hardcore science, and we need to have the data and the facts to back it up, and then we also need to take it forward, and we need to start communicating it. So. Um, so thank you all. I think I'm just conscious of the time because I, I'm really grateful that, that everyone has joined us for as long as you have. Um, and so thank you for that. So um, first of all, thank you to all the speakers and, and all the, 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 the impromptu speakers, both Hege and Dimitri. I really loved having you guys join us. Um, I think it really added a lot of value to, to what we're discussing. Um, as Lena said, this is certainly Team Seagrass and we are... Um, it's so interesting and uplifting and positive to hear kind of all the the things that are coming forward out of um, out of seagrass and really reaffirms why we should care about seagrass. So as I mentioned um, at the beginning of the webinar, this is part of the Blue Forest Week. And because of that, there will be a second webinar tomorrow, again, with a focus on seagrass, but this time on restoration. So we've already heard from Karine Gagnon um, from IMR, and she'll be the moderator uh, for that, that webinar tomorrow. And, and she just would like to just say a few words, hopefully give a quick introduction to that webinar. And if you haven't already signed up for it, then I really think you should. So I'll, I'll turn the floor over to, to Karine for a few minutes. Thank you, Tanya, and thank you to all the speakers. So today we've learned all about why seagrasses are important and their threats, and tomorrow we're going to move into how do we um, better conserve and restore them. So we have four presentations again, um, covering um, both tropical and temperate systems, uh, including West Africa, Southeast Asia, and Northern Europe, and uh, followed by a panel discussion. So we hope that you can join us tomorrow morning. Um, you will, if you signed up, you will receive an email this afternoon confirming the link um, just so that we can hopefully avoid the technical problems um, from the start of today's webinar. So see you tomorrow. Awesome. Thank you for thank you, Karine. Um, and and again, I would just really like to thank everyone, everyone for attending, all the speakers here, um, everyone for asking great questions and and really creating like a nice, lively discussion. Um, if you would like to stay, if the attendees would like to stay and discuss more with our speakers, we'll be having a, an open informal session. The speakers will just stay online and they'll be happy to answer any questions. Um, it can be a bit more informal depending if we have less people. Feel free to turn your video on and chat directly with our speakers. Um, so maybe I'll just ask the speakers to turn their cameras back on. Um, I see we have a lot of people staying. We have about 22 or more staying, um, which is great. I'm, I'm always loving having more people engage. Um, but this is one where you can't be quiet. So if you do have questions, um, feel free to, to maybe raise your hand. And we'll take everybody in order. And, and if you do have questions, um, when I call on you, if you want to turn your video on, say who you are um, and where you're from and then kind of who your speaker is for. So um, I don't see any hands raised right now. So it feels a little bit like um, people maybe are still logging off or maybe they just want to see what other people are asking. So, um, so yeah. Yeah. Um, all very quiet um maybe i'll just ask something um 
we talked a lot about the mapping. We talked a lot about that. Um, maybe maybe Lena and, and Carmen, do you guys want to just give a like a little bit of an overview on on what you're working on right now in terms of the the the, the projects that you're working on or the field work that you've got going on right now? And Abu, I don't know if you're still here or not. But but Carmen, maybe you want to start? Yeah, sure. Um, well, we, as part of a team, uh, we are working in several uh, projects in the uh, coastal lagoon here in South Portugal. It's called Ria Formosa. And here we have the three species, three of the four uh, native species, um, uh, Sustra Marina, Sustra Nolti, and Simoros Senodosa. And uh, we have projects regarding uh, mapping of ecosystem services uh, from fishery support to blue carbon, and also some of uh, some uh, studies of uh, uh, water purification. And we are also working on restoration at the pilot uh, scale, uh, small scales. Um, but now we are facing a problem. We have uh, an invasion of uh, cholera prolifera, which is a, uh, a green algae. Uh, which is, Well, it's not an invasive species, but it's acting as an invasive species. It's spreading very fast. Uh, in the in the lagoon, and it's uh, making more difficult the uh, transplantations and the uh, restoration efforts. Uh, so this is something we we need to think about uh, now. And uh, as I said, we work also in the education part. We try to um, uh, communicate our results and, and and to increase the awareness on seagrass meadows and all the coastal vegetated habitats here in the in the Ria Formosa lagoon. And with that, for that, we work with. Uh, with the schools, uh, with teachers, and also with uh, um, science museums, and um, yeah, basically these are the the main topics that we are now working on as a team. Yeah, thanks, Lena. Do you want to talk a little bit about yeah what you're doing? Uh, yeah, so uh, we have a I, I would say quite cool ongoing uh, uh, project uh, where we sort of gathered a lot of the uh, seagrass researchers in Europe and seagrass managers and seagrass policymakers uh, uh, to come together um, to identify the 100 uh, priority questions uh, to advance uh, seagrass monitoring, uh, management and conservation. And uh, it's, um, it's a very, we had a, a workshop in March and we are working on uh, trying to writing this paper up and uh, hopefully we can soon distribute it to all our uh, co-authors and um, it's been a, a really interesting uh, process uh, uh, to get together across Europe and see what's happening in different countries and see what the the most urgent questions are for for different uh, uh, regions um, within the Indo-Pacific Seagrass Network um, We've been a bit unfortunate with this COVID situation, uh, as many others, uh, but uh, we have um, 25 sites across the Indo-Pacific where we gather data uh, that we are, have now finally sort of created um, to make sure it's streamlined across all these sites to, and start, we are just starting to explore different patterns of uh, intertidal fisheries uh, across uh, intertidal fisheries in seagrass uh, across this vast uh, uh, region and it's it's really really interesting and we hope we will be able to uh, share more of what we find uh, during next year yeah thank you yeah hopefully i mean the covid situation's affected everyone <laughs> so we're all starting to, <laughs> no to go out in the field and <laughs> people are sick left and right and yeah it was uh, yeah yeah yeah, it's definitely been uh, a challenging time, you know, a pause, right? A pause, as we say. So, um, so um, I see Abu's Abu's fallen off, um, and but that's okay. But I'm wondering if. If well, we have both of you here. We have to we have to close in about five minutes. There's been so much going on with with COP27 in in the past few weeks, and you see all of this, and blue carbon is really rising high. Um, but we've also talked here a lot about the need to have. Um, I'll go check on Tanya and see what's Tanya looks a bit frozen.
Oh, there I'm gone. There I'm back. Oh my God. I'm so glad it only happened at the end of the webinar. <laughs> it only happened at the end of the webinar. So, um, but my question, I don't know how much you, you guys heard. So COP27, blue carbon everywhere. Lots of talk about it. Very exciting. Um, but we've been talking a lot about the need for, for linking biodiversity with climate change, right? And so, and so the CBD COP is coming up in in like a week or is starting now um do either of you anticipate that we're going to see the same level of discussion around these types of habitats and the links with biodiversity and and seagrass or blue carbon or blue blue forest ecosystems in general there i don't know if either of you are kind of following those processes um at all <laughs> sorry it might be outside of your of your I, angle I, 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 where do, you I, I do to, to uh, some extent and um, there are some really amazing people that are going to participate uh, that are uh, stewards or they are rooting for the the, we the well-being of uh, both us and our uh, ecosystems um, how much time they will actually get to communicate these uh, important uh, messages I, I don't know yeah. but it's also i mean we just know within a workplace or within our own family to sometimes agree on things and imagine then that every country in the world is going to agree on something i mean it's it's really really complicated it's really really complicated uh yeah yeah so carmen do you have anything to to add to that well, that's a, that was a tough question, but uh, well, I, I think that the important point is uh, whatever is the convention, whatever is the, the, the meeting of researchers and stakeholders or whatever, is that we cannot uh, dissociate the biodiversity and the climatic crisis. Right? So they are together and they have to be solved together. Because uh, well, if we think of blue carbon, blue carbon is because of the biodiversity of seagrasses in terms of the plants are also part of the of the system as a uh, uh, we are part of the biodiversity, and uh, if we lose seagrasses, which is also a loss of biodiversity, we're well, losing the services they provide. So it is very important that both problems are looked at together. And I think that's certainly what we're we're seeing, at least from from the work that I do, is is trying to not have have these separate discussions between climate change and biodiversity. Right? Is is there's a lot more, and a lot more like high level people are starting to say, guys. We can have separate conferences, but we still need to have these conversations together. And so I think that is that's quite valuable. And so, you know, fingers crossed that um, that it'll be that it'll be quite good. So, um, yeah, so so we're just I see that we have about two minutes left. I don't see any questions. I'm really glad everyone stayed and I hope that that you enjoyed, you know, our small kind of in, informal discussion. We were trying to imagine something, you know, like at a conference, you know, the speakers are there, you grab a cup of coffee in line, you know, you kind of chat. So we're. We're trying to, you know, make it feel like people are together. So I'm really glad that the the people online stayed. Um, we we didn't do a, a, a like a like a family photo, but for those of you who stayed, um, I've just been asked if we can just quickly turn on our cameras. If everyone who's left, about 14 people are left. If everyone just wants to flip on your video, um, we're just going to do a quick wave and do a bit of a screenshot and um, and show everyone who's here. So. Um, yeah, and then we'll, uh, unless there's any other questions, we'll, we'll close the session after that. So, um, yeah. Oh, it's so nice to see everybody. It's, <laughs> it's always so nice to, uh, yeah, to not feel like I'm talking into a computer. So, um, God, there's a few more people. <laughs> So um, if anybody else is online, um, there's a few more people. If not, um, maybe, oh, we got a few more people joining. So, and then there we go um okay rob do you want to do a bit of a screenshot everybody wave everybody wave <laughs> big seagrass wave for everybody so awesome good okay well i will um i will more formally close the meeting now so again thank you everybody who is here thank you everybody who stayed feel free if you've got questions um to reach out uh, to us on the, the NBFN email. This will be posted hopefully later today, if not tomorrow. So, but if you've got any more questions or want to interact with us or the speakers, um, we we really enjoy it. If not, we hope to see you tomorrow at the, the restoration webinar or maybe even at Oslo at the, uh, the hybrid event. So, right. Thanks everyone. Have a good rest of your day, wherever you are. So.